Thank you very much. Catherine, always great to see you uh, and always great to be uh, here at the forum. Peter, it's wonderful to meet you and I'm delighted that we're going to have 24 minutes together <laughs> to talk about something that I think is incredibly important. And But I'm going to start with one thing. Before we came on stage, ladies and gentlemen, I leaned over to Peter and I wanted to get the pronunciations correct. And I said, it's Moroni. He said, yes, it's Moroni. And I said, it's Yamana Gold. He says, no, it's Yamana Gold. And then proceeded to tell me about the history of the name Yamana Gold. So if you would so be kind to let us know where Yamana Gold came from, I'd be grateful. So Lisa, before doing that, let me share an anecdote with you. Uh, when I first formed the company, it is now the 19th year that this company has been in existence. Within a few years of that, uh, I got a call from one of my elderly uncles. And um, he had watched an interview of mine on one of the television stations. I think it might have been uh, one of the, uh, uh, the stations that deals with uh, uh, commerce. Uh, and um, he wondered how it was going at Mitsubishi. And I said, well, I'm not sure where Mitsubishi is coming from, but I think he thought that Yamana was Yamaha. Oh. And so he confused Yamaha with Mitsubishi and instead of Yamana. Did he want a motorcycle from uh, you? <laughs> you know, I, I thought of getting that for him, but he was elderly and it was very forgivable. Uh, so the name is a bit confusing, how to say it, how to pronounce it, but where does it come from? Um, when this company was taken public, when I took it public in 2003, uh, it was a reverse takeover of an existing shell. The name of the company was Yamana Resources. Uh, we did a reverse stock split, recapitalized new management, that's how, and new assets, which I hope bring into the company. Where did, what's the name of the company? What's the name of this new enterprise? And I looked up, what does Yamana mean? Yamana is an indigenous group in southern Argentina into Chile. Uh, they're a very hardy group. Uh, this is very, very cold weather, uh, and it is very windy, one of the, the windiest places in the world. Uh, and yet, they're very hardy. They, they uh, effectively dress with loincloths. They're not wearing heavy uh, uh, clothing. Uh, and it was near extinct, and it was just coming on the rise again. They, there's a language, or there's a Yamana language, and I thought, what a, a formidable opportunity. What a way to really start something right, which is to take an indigenous name, an indigenous group, uh, and, to, uh, and to see how, in the same way as they're rising from almost extinction, yeah. and how we can make this company rise to greater heights. Amazing. Well, I appreciate that. And I'm wondering, though, I think, I think your, uh, your relative, um, rather than the motorcycle, getting gold is always preferable <laughs> to receiving a <laughs> yes, motorcycle. That's right. So that's, he, he would have done better in the deal. Um, I would, you know, I'm a former minister of natural resources, so I'm familiar with the mining area, and I'm a mom of two boys. So I would fight anyone on this premise that Canada's greatest exports around the world is our mining knowledge and our hockey knowledge. Those are two things that I think of from my experience in terms of what we do well and how well we do around the world. From your experience where you have mines and you have communities that you work with around the world, what is it about the Canadian culture of mining being exported that is so important for us to understand that helps people around the world in, in really fundamental ways? Yeah, so, so regrettably, we're not graduating as many geologists and mining engineers in this country as we used to. Uh, a lot of the population of those who populate our industry are now more elderly. Mm. They're actually reaching retirement age. We have to replenish some of that. And in many countries in the world where we operate, uh, they do graduate more engineers, more geologists. But Canada provides experience. It provides access to capital. It provides training, provides best practices. Uh, and there is literally and figuratively a world of knowledge that Canadians can bring to bear. Yeah. And so we can uh, take advantage of uh, opportunities, but provide also beneficiation as a result of those opportunities. Uh, in parts of the world that uh, are well outside the bounds of Canada. And I think that that's an export that cannot be overlooked. Uh, Canadians, as a, a person born in Europe, I was born in Italy. My parents emigrated here, so I am adoptive to this country, but I adore this country. But as a Canadian um, uh, who chooses to live here, was not born here, uh, I'd say that one of the greatest exports that this country has, one of the greatest opportunities it has is this, there is an entrepreneurial spirit. We should promote it more. And certainly on the mining side, there is. And because there is capital in this country that, that tailors itself to mining, uh, I think that that affords us an opportunity in other parts of the world that uh, other countries just don't have. 
Yeah. Tell me a little bit about the impact that Canadian mines have on the communities in which they partner. So let's begin from the proverbial soup to nuts. First, we provide capital. Yeah. In addition to that, we provide expertise. Uh, so we're in a position to be able to say that we can develop, first explore for an asset and then develop that asset and then operate it because of the competency and expertise that we have. Mm -hmm. That investment then allows us to be able to say that we're providing beneficiation to local communities. Yeah. Many of these commu communities are impoverished. The unemployment rate is very high. We're not talking about a Canadian 5% or 6%. We're talking about unemployment that could be as high as 30% or 40%. Yeah. Uh, we provide uh, in industry. Part of what we try to do is say, how can we uh, promote not just what we're doing in mining, but also all the collateral things that are required for a mine. So procurement, as an example, and mm -hmm. local procurement. Uh, last year alone, for example, uh, our company, as an intermediate sized company, we produce a million ounces per year of production. So roughly a million, uh, uh, an intermediate sized company, perhaps uh, the smaller end of the senior companies. Uh, on procurement alone, local procurement, we, uh, we paid out about just under $550 million. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to encourage other industry. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the things that I don't think is well understood even to Canadians and even to Canadians that are in the extractive industries is that we have one of the highest ratios of, of uh, specific mine to collateral, uh, specific job to collateral jobs. So for every uh, uh, person that we employ in a mine, uh, we are creating at least three jobs outside of the mine. Hmm. And I think that that is critical to economic development in some of the parts of the world that are not economically uh, developed. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you have, you have uh, interests in Canada and you have interests around the world. When you take a look at the, the regulatory regimes, health and safety, is there a huge difference between the way we do business in Canada and the way that it's done around the world? So in some parts of the world, Lisa, I'd say that there is. Uh, we started with a policy, a strategic objective when, the comp when I first took the company public, that we wanted to be in jurisdictions in the Americas to start, mm -hmm. and then jurisdictions where there was mining culture, mining pedigree, uh, a familiarity with mining. Um, Rules-based, yeah. that is critical. Yeah. Part of rules-based then is jurisdictions where there is uh, a tolerance for health and safety, uh, for environment, for community sus sustainability, that is at least the equivalent of what we have in Canada. So as Canadians, I think we can bring best practices to certain countries, uh, but in many of the countries in which we operate, many of those best practices are already there. So we're actually in the position of saying we can improve on some of these practices because the, the baseline is already a high baseline. Yeah. The, um, one, of the, one of the things that we are learning now with the energy crisis, with the war in Ukraine, and with inflation is the reality that moving to transition to the new energy transition is going to be it's going to be one in which mining is going to feature prominently uh, if we are going to move to everyone being electrifi electrified then we're going to need the the minerals and we're going to need the metals that surround that uh, what do you see for the future in terms of of mining in the world and in canada mm. so, so i think the the premise has to be that uh, we will require metals from the ground. We will require extra extractive industries. Uh, we can agree to disagree f on certain things, but there is a certainty that we cannot live the lives that we live. The lighting that is here, the infrastructure in support of this room, those of you, because of the bright light, I can see those of you in the audience, but those of you who are in the audience who might be on their telephones, on a computer screen, if you bike to your office or from place to place, or if you take a car, we'll need metals from the ground. Yeah. So I don't think the issue is, should we have mining? I think the issue is, how do we make it responsible? Right. Uh, and how do we ensure sustainability? And how do we ensure that we're protecting the local environment and then more broadly, the, the, uh, the global environment? And certainly I think that we as a company, but also as an industry, we've been promoting that for many, many gener generations. Clearly we can do better and we are attempting to do better. But we will have money. Yeah. Uh, that is an inevitability unless we're prepared to change significantly how we run our lives today. And, and I would argue then that you can have a win-win scenario. I'm not a believer in a, 
in a no-win scenario. And there, there are plenty of opportunities to be creative and to say, how do we exploit an opportunity, create local beneficiation, not damage the environment, and still protect the globe from climate events? Right, and, and shareholders and stakeholders do care about ESG, and ESG is a very hot topic in mining right now. What would be your approach to ESG? You kind of outlaid a few of the pillars of it, but maybe if you can give us a, a, a better idea of how you're approaching ESG at your company and what you're seeing around the world. Yeah, so I, I would caution, Lisa, that um, um, the engagement in, in ESG matters and in climate in particular by the investment community is a recent phenomenon. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and why I provide the caution is that in the end, investors are looking to make money. Uh, and while the protection of ESG principles is important, uh, uh, the, the primary objective is to make money. Right. Uh, and so we need, we need to be sure that um, we're not doing it because investors are asking us to do it. We're doing it because it is the right thing to do. The mining industry, and, and I would argue that more broadly the extractive industries, at least for a generation, maybe a couple of generations, has already been going down that path and doing these things. Right. So we care about health and safety. Yeah. Uh, we care about the promotion, promotion of local community beneficiation. We care about the local environment. And in part, the reason for that is because a business is actually more sustainable, and even if not short-term profitable, longer-term profitable. Um, we are mining, we're extracting um, metals from the ground or other minerals and substances over the course of a decade, a dozen years, perhaps a couple of dozen years or longer. Uh, and so we have to look at it from the lens of that, that time frame uh, and say, if we're investing today in health, safety, environment and community, then we're, we're investing into the future. And if there is a cost to that, that mitigates a profit today, we will be generating longer longer term profits, and overall then the business is more valuable. Right. Let me go further. Um, you, you and I work together, yeah. and you are my boss, and you tell me that I should be taking a different course in how I'm doing the job, which protects my health. Uh, my spouse will love that, my children will love that, yeah. uh, and we actually create a relationship between employer and employee that is, is, uh, is better. Yeah. And that's the approach that we try to take. Okay. So in terms of, of carbon footprint, though, um, realistically, my understanding is that on a global wide basis, m mining does have a, a small percentage of, of total emissions, but still it is something that you take a look at uh, mm. through your operations and you want to make sure that you're doing the best that you can for the reasons you just gave. So, so precious metals mining represents uh, roughly 3% of the global emissions. Right. It's a very small percentage. Uh, I think those in the audience and, and, and watching on screen should take comfort that even though it's a small percentage, we really take it seriously. Yeah. Um, as a, a company our size, we, we emit about 1 14th the amount of carbon into the environment that an average airline emits. So we have a very small footprint. Mm. But, but why should... Well, why should we take it seriously? Because it isn't the size of the footprint uh, and the amount of carbon emissions. It is, as I said a few moments ago, it's the right thing to do. If we are already protecting the local environment, then I think we should be very comfortable protecting the broader environment, yeah. the global environment. And that's where investors, I think, have really provided a significant input. Because we as mining companies, we certainly were paying a lot of attention to the local environment, but we really didn't fully appreciate what was happening globally. And now we have that appreciation. Yeah. So what have we done? Uh, well, we have, uh, at the beginning of 2020, we, we indicated that by um, within a couple of years, we would be able to get to, to a path that would take us to by 2030, to that 1.5 degree threshold. We're now on that path. We've announced those goals. We recognize the amount of, of uh, based on a baseline of 2019, we understand the amount of emissions that we have to reduce. It's not a large percentage, it's about 5% per year. Mm -hmm. And we've also identified some of the, uh, the places where we can get big, big 
uh, improvements almost instantaneously. And that come back, comes back to that no-win scenario and win-win. Let, let me give you an example. Yeah. Coming back to southern Argentina and very, very windy areas. One of our mines, our Cerro Moro mine, is in one of the windiest areas in the world. Uh, so what we are now looking at, uh, and we're going through the feas feasibility process, it does look as if it works, that if we can take diesel generation, which is what we have at that mine, and 40 to 50% of the power gets generated by wind. Yeah. Uh, and the cost is, is not a very big cost to us. It's into the scores of millions, not more than that. What does that do then? Well, it reduces our carbon footprint to that 1.5 degree goal instantaneously. It doesn't cost a lot, a lot to be able to do it. And the win-win, we also get the benefit of an improvement to our cost that's quite radical. Right. Perhaps in the order of $150 per ounce of production wow. of improvement to costs. And those are the approaches that we, that, that we try to take. Yeah. That's the approach that we've taken on, on the carbon footprint. That's just an example of it. Yeah. But that ties back into the beginning of this, which is that Canadian can-do experience, that Canadian entrepreneurial uh, experience and uh, thinking out of the box mm -hmm. has allowed us here to be able to say that we can achieve the obje objectives of decarbonization while at the same time also making one of our operations more profitable. Yeah. You, you keep coming back to community, community of the, where the mine is, obviously is, is really important. Um, one of the things that I saw last weekend when I was reading the Toronto Star was a, a full page um, announcement from Red Cross thanking your company and you for your philanthropic continued support in their operations, day-to-day -day operations. And I wanted to ask you a little bit about it because you're not a massive company. And Red Cross is a, a very large endeavor, but for them to take that significant step to thank you so publicly, you must be having a significant impact internally. Can you share with us a little bit about why Red Cross is so important to you and to Yamana Gold? Well, well, gifting is important to the company. It's important to our family. It's important to our, uh, our executives and our board of directors, individually and, and corporately. Um, I, I have to confess, if I can take a step back, that they asked because they knew my personal tolerances, they asked if it was okay to run the ad. Yeah. Uh, I prefer a little bit of anonymity. Right. If we're gifting, we're gifting because uh, our, our soul is saying that we should, because we think it's the right thing to do, uh, not for recognition. Uh, the observation that was made was, but the recognition also allows others to understand that if you're doing it, others might be willing Correct. to do it as well. Very much so. And that was a, an eye opener for me. And yeah. so we, we agreed that that ad uh, should run. Why, why did we do it? Uh, well, uh, it began several years ago. Many of you are familiar with the impact of hurricanes, and again, it ties back into what's happening with climate. Uh, and we had a, a, a hurricane at the time that was very close to home and close to our financial community. So Hurricane Sandy created havoc, yeah. considerable damage to New Jersey, to New York. And so we said, why don't we find an organization that will provide some support? Mm -hmm. This is very close to home and close to, we're a public company, so very close to uh, that capital base for a public public company. And the Red Cross came through. And the Red Cross is one of these organizations that uh, most of its money goes uh, to the things that it should be doing rather than to overhead. Right. Uh, it has one of the, the best track records in the world. And then we, we as we learn more, Lisa, it's uh, God forbid someone's home catches fire. Uh, we know the fire department is going to be there, but how do you get water and, and blankets and clothing and a place to sleep? Well, that's what the Red Cross does. And so our, the conclusion that we reached was this is an organization that fits very nicely into the, the code of conduct that we have, and that's why we've agreed to, to, yeah. to support them. Yeah, and I know that you don't talk about it publicly, but you also uh, have made a significant donation to Princess Margaret Hospital, and I think that's an important thing to note as well, that locally and internationally, that those are philanthropic endeavors. Um, I know- And, and may I comment on that? Oh, that, please, yes. Uh, what, uh, cancer afflicts us all. Yeah. Uh, we have all lost people as a result of this terrible uh, illness. Um, when they asked for us and if we would be willing to contribute, uh, what we did was we said we'll, we will contribute, but we'd like to do it over a period of years, and we're, we don't need a name on the masthead. Our contribution goes to research. It goes to fellowships. So there's an award. We don't participate in who gets awarded. It's the hospital that does that. We merely provide the funding. Yeah. 
so doctors and research scientists get the benefit of half a million to a million dollars per year, and they get to do really funky and novel research that hopefully, within this, the course of, uh, of less than a lifetime, yeah. allows more lives to be saved. But that's entrepreneurial, so that makes sense. Fair enough. That's a fair thing for... Now, I know that you are speaking uh, on a panel for the Financial Times next week, and it has to do with talent. And I'm wondering if you can give us a little bit of a sneak preview of your thoughts that you'll be sharing with the rest of the world on the difficulties around talent right now. If you speak to um, Victoria Mancinelli from Leuna, who is here and they're sponsoring the VIP room, you'll, you'll know that we have a serious crunch on labor, but any CEO in the country will also tell you there's a serious demand for, for workers everywhere you go. What perspective are you gonna bring to the panel next week? Well, um I'm still collecting my thoughts. Yeah. Um, but I, I think part of the message, and I'm looking forward to what the other panelists have to say, and hopefully we can have a good dialogue, but uh, a part of the message is that we're, um, and, and I have children that are uh, in the millennial age. Uh, I have younger children, but some that are in the millennial age. And, and I find it interesting that many of that, that cohort is not looking at the phenomenal things that the extractive industries actually does. Mm. Uh, so there, there is uh, certainly something that is very appealing uh, about technology. But then we have to look at it and say, well, what technological innovations are being applied to mining that are improving the way that uh, people's health and safety is supported, that improves, improves the local environment? Yeah. We're not graduating enough geologists and enough engineers. Yeah. And many of the cohorts that are in the industry are getting to a retirement age. And so I think that there will be a very uh, severe shortage of people, certainly in this country, and that's a shame. Yeah. And, and so I'm not an engineer or a geologist. I'm a lawyer by training. Uh, I hope I'm not saying anything offensive that there are probably too many lawyers in the world and not enough engineers and geologists. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there you go. Um, but but I, I think that uh, we should be promoting these things in Canada because we're good at it. Yeah. And we're good at exporting that talent we're good at the beneficiation that we described, and, and we're, we're phenomenally good then at, at training other people in other countries so that they could rise up into the ranks as well and put food on their tables. Yeah. So, and, and I'm going to give you credit for the quote that you said to me last week when we were discussing this, because it really has stuck with me. You said that mining isn't just about the minerals in the ground, it's about the people on the ground. And that's a great contribution that we make as well. And, and that's the theme that you're going to talk about. We only have a few seconds, but I'd be very remiss if I didn't ask you if you had any advice that you think you could give to an entrepreneur, a junior miner, somebody starting out, um, what would it be? What would it be as you look? Because I, there's great opportunity in Canada and abroad. There's great opportunity in this field. What would be the advice that you would give them? Boy, what, what a, that, that's a really difficult question. Uh, but you and I have had a, a brief dialogue on, on some of these things. And, and as I reflect on it, I, I, I guess what I would say is that I, I, I hope I can say that I've been blessed at being entrepreneurial, uh, particularly with this company. Um, it is a blessing, I think, that comes from being in this country. Mm -hmm. um, but what I would say to someone who wants to be entrepreneurial is, the natural tendency of most human beings in, in most fields is to tell you what you cannot do. Mm. And I think what you have to do is you have to ask that next question, which is, what is the way to do it? And, and think about it and come back. And that's how ideas get formed. Uh, and then the bouncing of ideas back and forth. Anecdotally, and if I may share with you, yeah. uh, in 2003, uh, when I decided to do this, it was an asset that we have since sold a bit of the history to it. This was our Chapada mine. It was a copper gold mine in Brazil. And it had a, what was then called a feasibility study that had been done to it. Uh, and I treated it more as an advanced uh, development state, uh, exploration stage project than a development stage project. The feasibility study referred to a work index. Work index is the hardness of the rock. I'm not a geologist or an engineer. But I asked a geologist and engineer, what would you do? And he said it would take a lot of money. I said, but let's assume for a moment that I'll find the money. What would you do? And the first reaction was, well, it's going to be very difficult. The next reaction at that question was, what would you do? Yeah. 
uh, what are the solutions? And then one solution came to another and then to another. So um, what can we count on as a success as a result of that dialogue and asking those questions? Uh, a mine that was purchased, a property that was purchased for, for $17.5 million dollars generated from 2007 to 2019, $200 million per year. And we sold it for just under a billion dollars in wow. 2019. That's entrepreneurialism in my view. Yeah. So if you had stopped at, it's going to cost too much money, you would and never- And hard to do, we would never have gotten to that solution. Very good. That's correct. I think that's great advice. And we are at our time, Peter. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you.